Hello and welcome to Lecture 2 in English 311, Advanced Composition and Rhetoric, Fall 2015. I am Dr. Renee Dupre and I will be talking to you today a little bit about rhetorical strategies. First, a brief overview of today's agenda. And I'd like to emphasize that in this course, which is an Advanced Composition and Rhetoric course, I am hoping that my talk today is a bit of a review of some of the rhetorical strategies that you covered in your English 111 course. So look at this as a review, a refresher, and a chance to practice some of these skills again will be coming up again and again in our course. But I do expect that you already have a kind of a fundamental grasp of some of these concepts. But the things we'll be reviewing today are, first of all, fundamentally the definition of rhetoric. What is rhetoric? And what is a rhetorical strategy, strategy or mode that you will be using as a writer? Um, I'll then look and spend quite a bit of time talking about some common rhetorical modes, um, provide you with a few examples of successful rhetoric that I'm going to ask you to look up on your own and listen to and some additional resources. Finally, we do have room for questions even in an online lecture format and you will find a discussion area post titled Rhetorical Strategies where you are welcome to post any questions or comments that you have about this lecture. So let's get started. First, what is rhetoric? Rhetoric seems like a big fancy word and often I found that students are kind of cowed by the idea of taking a course in rhetoric. But rhetoric is really nothing more than a way to analyze and use tools to address how you say what you say. Let's think of one of the simplest examples, the words thank you. Anybody who's ever been around a child knows that the words thank you can be used in many, many different ways. Thank you can be meant with sincerity, with absolute sincerity, or it can be meant you can say thank you in a way that simply means that you're not thankful at all. Think about the many ways you can use just those two simple words and you'll start to get an idea of what rhetoric really is. According to the Purdue OWL, rhetoric is any communication used to modify others' perspectives. And when we're modifying someone's perspective, we are really doing one of the things that we do best, and we talk about a lot in composition courses, which is persuasion. We are persuading somebody to see the world just a little bit differently after reading our work. And that's really what we're doing with rhetoric. So to use rhetoric, you need to use some very specific ways of approaching what it is you're saying, and those are strategies. So it's often called modes as well. Rhetorical strategies or modes are the strategies that you choose to convey that meaning. Not every rhetorical strategy is going to be appropriate in every situation. Some will be more effective in certain situations, some will be effective in others, and that's up to you as a writer to choose which ones to use, how to mix and match, which ones to emphasize. Importantly, rhetorical strategies provide you with a pattern or a model that can help you to express your ideas effectively. Now I know that we all want to be the one who invents an entirely new way of writing and expressing ourselves, but realistically what we are trying to do really in a course like this is to learn how to use these rhetorical strategies effectively, concisely, and innovatively. The patterns often by the rhetorical strategies that we'll be discussing give you a way to make your point effectively and within those patterns you will find that you can become more creative than you ever dreamt of. Just a moment to talk about the um, 
image here on the right hand side of the screen. Every time that we have an opportunity to write or to address somebody, to persuade somebody, we have what's called a rhetorical context and a call to action. What is the context in which you are writing? And in order to make your point, you're going to be needing to use three different things. First, logos, logic. You need to be making your points in a logical manner. Secondly, ethos. You're going to be appealing to the moral and ethical dimensions of your argument for your readers. And finally, pathos. This pathos is when you appeal to feeling. So these are all things that we'll be using in our rhetorical approaches. I spoke a little bit about this on the earlier slide, but really why should you as a writer use a rhetorical strategy? Why can't you just start writing willy-nilly? Well, first of all, it's going to make your life a lot easier if you have some idea of how you're going to organize and pattern your ideas. And I'm talking we're moving one step beyond the basic the basic bread and butter essay that has the introduction, three paragraphs, and conclusion, right? Um, you'll still be using that structure, but you're going to be using it in a different way. Within the overall structure of introduction, body, and conclusion, you'll be address you'll be using some of the patterns we'll be talking about. The rhetorical strategy can help you to develop some of your ideas simply because you're going to be saying, well, how can I compare and contrast these two things? Or how can I define something? Just by asking yourself these questions, you're going to start to expand your ideas. Secondly, a rhetorical strategy can help you to order your ideas. Often after we've done a brainstorming or a free writing exercise, we have so many ideas and they're all there, but we don't know exactly how to order them, where they go in our essay. And that's where a rhetorical strategy can help. And finally, and probably most importantly, the rhetorical strategy can help you to do what you're really setting out to do. That's achieve a specific effect in your reader. That is, we're going to persuade our readers. Here are some common rhetorical strategies and modes which you will see used again and again. Most essays will employ several of these modes with one overarching mode as the common, most important strategy used in that essay. I will go through these one by one with some examples of maybe some types, just titles of essays that you might think about that would be predominantly um, that essay type. So without further ado, let me move into each one of these. First one is description. Description is the bread and butter of the writer. If you can't describe something, meticulously, carefully, and accurately, then you need to go back to square one in your writing. Learn how to describe. And to learn how to describe, you need to learn how to slow down, pay attention, look, listen, feel, taste, and touch. When we use description, we're using words to capture the very essence of a person, place, object, or feeling. Words make a difference. You use the senses. Touch, taste, smell, sight, sound. That's how we experience the world as human beings. So we can use those same senses when we are writing about how we experience the world. And don't forget that sense of smell. Often writers forget smell as a really important um, sense in description. Description can come in two ways. Um, you can describe with two sort of goals. The first one is objective description, in which we try to be as objective as possible. I'm going to throw aside for the moment theoretical arguments about whether it's even possible to be objective. But 
In this type of description, you are simply trying to describe the object as it is without conveying any feelings about that object. We see journalists often held to that standard where a journalist might be expected to simply record the notes of a meeting. Or in a scientific paper, you might be measuring the dimensions of something, its temperature, and providing objective measurements that help you to describe that object. The second type is subjective, in which through your description you are trying to persuade the reader of something. Let's think about the difference between describing somebody as a long lanky cowboy versus a tall skinny ranch hand. Two completely different images that could possibly be applied to exactly the same character. Each one has a certain set of feelings, a certain set of judgments really, and those subjective descriptions can help you to make your point, or if you're not careful they can detract from it. So how can you use description? As an essay, you could simply build an essay around my grandmother's house. And maybe the point of the essay would be to learn something really, really important about your grandmother that she taught you as your way of being in the world. Pearl Harbor today. Five degrees hotter could be an essay about what the world would look like, simply describing the world if the average temperature rose by five degrees. Description is also used as a strategy within an essay. You could open an essay on health problems in the homeless with a description of a homeless family with a very, very careful description of what they looked like. Where are they sitting? What's their environment? Um, say you were writing an essay on after-death experiences. You could include a description of a person who experienced one. What did that person look like? Not necessarily their story, that's narration, but simply describing the person. In an essay on Pope Francis' stance on climate change, you could include a description of the Pope speaking to a particular audience. When we use description, we start to bring things to life, and that helps us to convince our readers. A second mode that goes hand in hand with description is narration. In an essay, what we're doing is we're simply using a story to make your point. Both of those things are essential. We're telling a story, but the story has to make the point. The story can come from personal experience, it can be anecdotal, it can come from the third person, but that story is the central piece. This week we're reading Sharman Russell's Ghosts, which is a story about her father. And as we will discuss this week, we'll talk about how she uses that mode of narration and description to make her point, to make a very, very strong point in that essay, one that resonates with many of us. Narration usually incorporates descriptive elements, and one of the key things that narration can do is it can help the reader to identify with the writer or the subject of the story. We can start to say, oh, I know what it feels like to be that person in a Wells told story. When we're using narration, we also have to remember that el every element counts. Everything that you introduce needs to have a point. You can't just introduce things willy-nilly. And as the famous Russian poet Anton Chekhov once said, if a gun is loaded in Act 1, it must go off by Act 3. By which he meant, if you introduce a gun in the beginning of your story and you load that gun, that gun needs to then play a role in the story. And the same thing even when we're writing an essay. Every element needs to count. So how can you use narration? 
as an essay. You could write an essay about my father's escape from Alcatraz. And maybe the point of the story might be just how horrific conditions are at Alcatraz um, when tragedy strikes a small town, when home births go wrong. Each one of these essays could be built around a story, that mode of narration, but used to make a point. Within an essay, you can also use narration. For instance, in an essay on two cuisines, you could tell the stories of two cooks in two different kitchens. In an essay on imprisonment and young women of color, you could tell the stories of two youth of different ethnic backgrounds and where they are in their trajectories of life and maybe why. The stories can give us the why. A third mode I'll discuss is example. And this is one that I know you've had ground into you probably since junior high days. But simply the idea of examples that you need to support your ideas with concrete specific details. You need to show rather than just tell. And remember, strong examples support your thesis. You should use example in all essays. For instance, if you are writing an essay on can local farmers solve the obesity crisis? You could use an example a farm to table program that actually did have an impact on obesity rates. Um, in an essay on college dating can be hazardous to your health. You could provide some examples of dates gone wrong. So those examples, which could be <laughs> provided using some of the modes of description and or narration, can serve to make your point. As an essay, example can also be used. For instance, an entire essay could be built around one person's transgender, transgender journey, challenging gender norms. That example could provide some a way for you as a writer to discuss some of the challenges of crossing gender in our society. An essay on Amelia Earhart, the feminist, could provide Amelia Earhart as an example of a feminist in the early 1900s. Fourth mode, definition. Definition is simply explaining a word, object, or idea so the reader really knows what the writer means. Definition provides you and the reader a mutual starting point. And so your mode of saying, hey, we're going to agree that this is what this means. It allows you to explore the special qualities of a word or a phrase. And you can define in multiple ways, for instance, by a classification, this is a type of, or by purpose, this is used for. So there are different ways to define things. One hint is to find something first, then use the word. So if you are defining an amoeba, you provide your definition and then say, commonly called an amoeba. Definition can be used as the major organizing mode for an entire essay. For an instance, you could write an entire essay on the Chihuahuan Desert defining what is the Chihuahuan Desert or the Montessori method in pre-K education. What is it? Simply defining it or rhetorical strategies in writing. This lecture is an example of definition as its major rhetorical mode. In an essay, you can also use definition, and you should use definition, especially if you're going to be introducing complex terms or terms that might have multiple meanings. Say you're writing an essay on comics political influence, you might need to define Bugs Bunny and the Roadrunner too. In an essay on textiles and child labor, you're going to have to define child in its different cultural contexts, various types of textile industries, other things that might need defining in that essay. Process analysis. This is the classic how-to essay. In a process analysis essay, you take apart a process step by step and then you explain the parts. 
you present the steps or stages in chronological order. It can be used in an instructional mode, how-to, or in an informative mode. It can help you, especially you historians, to explore how or why did something happen. Some examples of instructional essays might be how to tie your shoes, how to teach a dog to roll over, how to herd cats, go to WikiHow and you'll see lots and lots of examples, not all of them very good. Or it could be informational. For instance, you could parse out the step-by-steps of how climate change affects the spread of West Nile virus, how a bill becomes a law, or how a laser printer operates. Those are all process analysis type topics. Division and classification is another rhetorical mode. Division takes a general concept and breaks it into smaller categories. It can be used to break a complex subject into parts, making it easier to understand. Classification works in the opposite way. Classific and start, classification works when you have multiple different parts and you need to find a way to organize them. Your job then is to organize things, clustering things together to make sense of them in a way that classifies them or categorizes them into different areas. You're going to group them based on common traits. Some examples of division might be 13 ways of looking at a blackbird a famous poem by Wallace Stevens. You could write an essay that parses the different elements of the Syrian refugee crisis. Classification might be an historical essay in late 19th century architectural styles where you as the writer can take those styles and classify them into different areas or groupings or in an essay that argues perhaps that cheerleading should be in an Olympic sport. I'm not sure if it is now or not, but the first thing you'd need to do would be say what characteristics make a sport worthy of the Olympics and after you've established that you would then have to show how cheerleading displays those characteristics and meets those criteria. So that would be a classification type project. Comparison and contrast. I'm assuming that at this point in your careers you've all run into the comparison and contrast essay. In the comparison and contrast essay you take two or more elements, you compare them, in what ways are they similar, and you contrast them, in what ways are they different. And I do not ever want to see a thesis statement that says they are similar but different. That's your job is to move to a point in your thesis statement where you can be specific about those similarities and differences. Remember, I'm talking about similarities and differences as a pattern. When you get to the level of writing an essay, you should be able to talk about similarities and differences specifically. You can structure your essay in different ways, point by point or item by item. Generally, the stronger, more sophisticated essay uses the comparison and contrast point by point as opposed to just presenting one entity and then the other. Um, the latter, the one then the other is rather kind of like a high school level. In this class I would definitely expect you to be able to do a point by point comparison and contrast. And never forget in as in all essays, what's the point? Why is it important that you are going to be comparing and contrasting these two items? How you would use it, here's some just sample essay title ideas. Two small towns, two ways to college. Labor laws in the United States versus Mexico. Montessori versus a traditional classroom. You can see how those two things could be, in each one of those two things could be compared and contrasted. You may have three things to compare and contrast. In an essay, you could use this strategy in a broader essay that might use a different overall organizing principle, but you could compare and contrast two women's approaches to gaining the vote in an essay on suffragettes. 
and an essay that broadly looks at raising the minimum wage. You could compare and contrast two employers' approaches to um, paying their employees and keeping them on board and retaining them. So those are just some examples of compare and contrast. One more thing on comparing and contrast, and I'm not expecting any essays on puppy dogs, but this is just an example that might give you a little bit of idea of the difference between comparing and contrasting. Say you were writing an essay on Labradors versus German Shepherds. The first thing that you want to look at are what are the things they have in common? And you'll see in this row, where my cursor is, the things they have in common. They're both dog breeds. They're both types of working dogs. They both like playing ball or frisbee, or tend to as breeds, and they're both large dogs. I'm sure there are many other similarities we could go through, but just for the purposes of this example, bear with me, and we can say that all of these things are things that both have in common. So here's your comparison. On the other hand, we also want to contrast them. How are they different? Well, we know German Shepherds were first bred in Karlsruhe, Germany. Whereas Labradors were first bred in Labrador, Canada. We know that Labradors tend to have solid colors. Whoops, apologies. Versus the multicolored coats of German Shepherds. German Shepherds tend to have fluffier coats, Labs oily, flatter coats. Labradors function as duck retrievers, whereas German Shepherds' rule has been sheep herding and guarding. Um, shepherds tend to work best on land, whereas the Labradors tend to work best in the water. So here's your contrast. You can take any topic, lay it out like this, and this will help you to get going in terms of organizing your ideas for a comparison and contrast essay. Finally, a few words about the cause and effect essay. Probably the most dangerous, but also one of the most interesting types of essays to write. In the cause and effect essay, you're basically arguing that one thing leads to another. You're setting out to explain the relationship between two things and saying that A causes B. But you have to be careful. There may be many causes and there may be many effects. Just because I brought my umbrella to school today did not mean that it didn't rain. There are going to be many, many causes of rain and many, many things that could have happened just because I brought my umbrella to school today. So be very careful of association versus cause. Often in the scientific literature, you'll see writers say that it was linked to or associated with. An association can simply say that, oh, we see this pattern here that you've elicited in a pattern. However, that is not necessarily a causal relationship. So we have to be very careful of that logical fallacy which is the one that says that I brought my umbrella today so it's not going to rain. And that's the post hoc ergo propter hoc. So how do you use it? Just some sample essay topics. The impact of decreasing oil prices on summer tourism in Maine. You could write an essay in which you examined what happens when oil prices go down to the summer tourism industry in Maine. So cause in effect. Katrina's lasting legacy, 10 years later, a family in chaos. Could be an essay in which you use description, narration, but your overall organizing principle might be cause and effect. Katrina caused what for this family? And is this family representative of many other families that were affected by that hurricane? The effects of pre-K exposure to iPads on children's literacy levels in third grade. Sounds like a scientific study, which it might be. But again, exposing children to iPads during pre-K years, how is that going to affect their literacy levels in third grade? So you're asking about cause and effect. Um, Climate change is an underlying factor in the Syrian refugee crisis. 
obviously many, many different um, effects rising out of climate change, but can it be affecting that political world of the Syrian refugee crisis? So those are all a, just a brief review of some rhetorical modes. I'm going to urge you to take a few moments and listen to each one of these truly great rhetorical addresses. The first one is probably the most famous, Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream. It was delivered August 28, 1963. And please take a few moments, click on this link, and listen to it. The second one, John F. Kennedy's inaugural address, delivered January 20th, 1961. Again, an amazing speech, one that might be exactly, I think if you listen to it, you will be impressed. Um, Ursula Le Guin's left-handed commencement address, which was delivered in 1983. And finally, the most recent one, as we go across the years, Barack Obama on the shooting at Charleston Emanuel AME Church, which a moving and deeply, deeply well-developed speech. As you listen to these speeches, I urge you to think about the rhetorical strategies that each of the speakers is using. List them down. I'm not going to give you an assignment to do it, but I'm hoping that you'll be curious enough and inquisitive enough that you will take a few moments with a scratch piece of paper, list these speeches, and just write down as you note the different types of rhetoric that each speaker is using. Here are some additional resources for you on rhetoric. I especially love Robert A. Harris's Virtual Salt. It's a, I would bookmark that if I were you and just hang on to it. It's a wonderful, wonderful website. Now he has a detailed resource of more than 60 sentence level rhetorical devices that you can use and play with, literary devices. Um, and some of the other common culprits here, the Purdue Owl, um, the University of North Carolina Writing Center, and then this resource here with the rhetorical strategies. Not only is a nice resource itself, it has many links to other resources and lots of examples that can be useful for you. So that's what I have for today. Um, if you have any questions, please post them to the Rhetorical Strategies General Discussion. And I look forward to seeing you online and jumping into our discussion of Charmin F. Russell's ghosts. Thanks.